This week, we're going to learn about the basics of design. To introduce this topic, I've invited three design experts from the University of Maryland to talk to us about their ideas of design and how they use it in their work. Dr. Tammy Clegg, Dr. Mona Lee Guha, and Dr. Allison Druin. I'm going to ask them about design and how it relates to usability and HCI. They're going to talk about some specific topics in this discussion, and those are things that we'll probe more in depth in the lectures that come later this week. Design is really two different kinds of things. It's process, okay, but it's also, I mean, it, it, are you designing the visual look of it? Are you designing the functionality? There are many different ways to look at design. Mm -hmm. So most of the work that we do is in participatory design. And Allison and I and Tammy as well um, design mainly for children. So our design process comes out of a philosophy of if you're going to design for children, you can design with children. So our process includes children along every step of the way of the process from brainstorming through iteration through um, you know iterative testing. Um, we include our users the whole way through. Um, and I think that that sh should, from my philosophy, transfer to any population you're designing for, right? So if you're going to go and design for bankers, you probably want to have bankers working with you because you're not a banker, right? Or if you're going to design for dogs, you got to have the dogs around because you're not a dog, right? So you have to have your population um, working with you, and that's what ends up at the end. You have a, a product that has a lot more insight um, than, than if you didn't have that voice all along the way. Actually, it, it turns out that um, this process was not originally for children. Mm -hmm. In fact, it came in the 1970s, it came out of um, the Scandinavian countries mm -hmm. um, from the social democratic movement. Mm -hmm. And what happened was um, there were factory workers that said, how do these computer scientists know how to make um, you know, computer systems that I'm going to use in my factory? They have to know about me. And so it was from the Scandinavian co-design um, experiences that, that those were the first times in which it was people talked about um, participatory design. We applied it in the 1990s and through to today, and people continue to iterate on this. But probably the most, I would say, the most um, used used um, design technique may not necessarily be co-design or participatory design. Mm -hmm. It may be in testing. Once you make something, you test it with people. It might also be in what people would call informant design, where you bring in your user just at the beginning of a design process where you most need to be informed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you ask, so, so Tammy, tell me what it's like to jump rope. And then, you know, and so, you know, Tammy jumps <laughs> rope and we find out what's going on with her and things like that. And then, um, and then Tammy goes away and then, the adults or the designers or the or the computer scientists go off and make great things and then we bring back the user at some point or another to to test and so on. Yeah. And a lot of times people will use like interviews and observations mm -hmm. too, sort of at the beginning of a design phase, um, where they actually go out and kind of just they may just go out in public and like if they're observing like a technology that might or some something that might be used out in public and just go see people who don't even know that they're being observed. You have to get IRB, you know, for those types of things too. But <laughs> but a lot but um but or if you're a design something to be used in the workplace, you might go in the workplace and to see to see like how people are actually using the existing technologies and kind of what are the exist existing systems some structures and things like that that are um, that are that are kind of going on, and then people might also do interviews to sort of get an inside perspective. Um, that reminds me that there are certain populations that you're more likely to see certain kinds of design processes mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. So with children, it's now become the most used um, design process is the participatory design, the co-design process, mm -hmm. particularly because we really can't be children in 2014. Right. Um, however, um, you know, for particular like certain professions, certain um, certain uh, older adults, and so on, you can do different kinds of design processes, and they're more common. So one of the things I always suggest to people is take a look at what other people are doing, so that you know 
that you're actually probably doing something similar and, and it's going to it's going to make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and another type of design, if you are um, unable for some reason to work with your uh, target audience at all, there are some, you know, sometimes you're in a company and there's restrictions on you can't work with children or mm -hmm. things like that. There's also a type of design um, called persona design mm -hmm. where basically you kind of start out by doing what Tammy said, really observing the, the target population and then you create these personas and you make really detailed people. Right? And you say, okay, so this persona is um, Jackie, and Jackie's 12 years old, and she likes to play sports, and she does all right. these things. And you make a few of these, and you keep them in mind, and constantly refer yeah. to them throughout your design process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, and in my opinion, that's never going to get you as, as much wonderful, rich um, design as it would if you had the children working with you. But if there's um, restrictions yeah, where you right. can't work with your user population, I think personas can help with that. They do this a lot with the military, because mm -hmm. obviously, sometimes you can't get um, clearances. If you're if you're designing for um, high high security situations, and so this is um, now it happens that you guys might be designing for high security, in which case um, then you might consider personas, you might consider um, a limited testing. People also do um, distance um, distance design, okay, where they will um, interview somebody via Skype. They may ask people to give them a tour via Skype. They may, you know, you might not even be in the facility because you're not allowed to be in the facility, but you can use distance technologies to actually get you in there in some way. Well, okay. One of the ways to do it, there's a, there's a bunch of different sort of continuums you can look at, is that where in the design process are you? So have you, um, have you already decided on the idea and then in which case then it's, um, it's just iterating on that, okay? Then there's a set of design processes you might use um, versus are you in the ideation stage and, and then you use different design processes. There's also um, how many, how much resource, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, do you have a lot of money to, to and a lot of time, mm -hmm. and a lot of people, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Um, many times people end up working with, uh, you know, with universities to, to work on these kinds of things because they don't have a lot of resource and they don't have a lot of time to deal with this. Um, the other is, um, what's their goal? You know, is it to make better product? Is it to, is it to create a theory? Is it something else entirely? And depending on what your goal is in terms of the design process, that will also tell you what you need to do. So if you're trying to be theoretical, then you're going to need more, um, you know, ge generalizable and scientific ways of understanding um, what users are doing, and you may end up testing with thousands of people to make sure that this thing is bulletproof. Okay, versus, um, you know, is your goal making a really good uh, piece of technology and um, you know and be innovative and so on then co-design might be a different kind a, a different method for you mm -hmm. I think if you're if you're some guy building an app in your basement, um, think about who you're building it for, and then go talk to those people. And I my my instinct is that probably if you've decided to build this app, you have a reason to, um, you know, so that you could talk to. Maybe it's for a certain set of your friends, or you know, a certain people you work with. Um, I think that getting input from the user it, it, as early as you can is probably a good idea. So I think that even if, even if you have no resources and you're just by yourself, that you can probably find someone who's, if not a part of your end user group, at least somewhat tangential to that user group to talk to and say, what ideas do you have on this? And I think sometimes you're surprised. We are, um, not as much anymore, but still, when we think, wow, we have this great idea. And then we put it in front of the kids and they're like, wow. That the idea is over here, you know, <laughs> the, the, the good space. But you, the idea, and, and and if you hadn't talked to them initially, you wouldn't know that. And then and then you spend months in your basement, and then you take it out, and the person goes, ah, the idea is over here, not over there. 
And I, I think that that kind of raises some interesting points too about when, when and how you take things to users. Um, so, you know, like as Moni said, you want to take it to them early and often. Um, so you shouldn't feel like you want to make this like polished, polished prototype, right? And then take that to them because then what, do you, what you'll find is that your users will be a lot more hesitant to give you their ideas about, um, about it, um, to elaborate with you on it because they'll think it's already, it's already finished. And you'll be a lot more hesitant to accept mm -hmm. what it is that they say because you've already put so much time um, and, and energy into this particular, going out into this particular um, um, uh, design, you know. This, so, yeah, so, yeah so, so taking those paper prototypes and building them out um, and building them out and building them out kind of iteratively is what it's going to be. Hardest thing is, is that there's no right answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's only good directions to yes. try. Yes. There is no universal must be. There is also no... Um, can't do it that way, absolutely not, because it's it's it depends on your user, depends on your resource, depends on what you're doing, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And design is messy, and that's okay. Yes. Um, that that's that's you have to be comfortable with a certain amount of mess and uncertainty, um, because that's how the process works. Because it's a creative process. And some people don't like that yeah. like messiness and that yeah. like, wow, there's no right answer. Wait a second, what yeah. am I doing it for? You know. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, you'll run into like constraints, right? Like you'll come up with like some idea or something like that, and then there are all these constraints, right? Oh, we want to make this great big mobile system, but now it needs to be plugged in. So how are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. And you can get it can sometimes be overwhelming, but the but what I've learned is that you have to take those constraints and let those be uh, like that. Let those motivate your creativity, right? You know, okay, so I don't like I have to plug this thing in, right? So how what what new can we do? Like how can this make me like more innovative, right? Um, so thinking about it like that instead of, you know, getting overwhelmed by some of those things. In this video, we're going to talk about different design methodologies. In the interview that we saw previously, some of these methodologies were mentioned, and in fact there's a number of ways that people go about designing technology, including security systems. This lecture will allow you to see some of those different methodologies, we'll even look at some of them in work, and you'll be able to see how to take some of those and integrate them into a process when you're designing technology on your own. First let's talk about the design process. The goal ultimately is to see where these ideas come from. This is what the design process gives us. So you may come up with ideas just sitting by yourself in the room. You may talk with users. You may talk with other designers. Different design processes help us develop ideas in different ways. There's a lot of different design processes. In this video, we're going to look at a few of these, including iterative design, system-centered design, user-centered design, participatory design, which we talked about a little bit in the interview, and designer-centered design. And let's talk first about iterative design, because this in fact fits into a lot of the other design methodologies we'll talk about. If we start at the top, we come up with a list of requirements for the system that we're going to build. So if you were building an authentication system, for example, you would come up with a list of requirements. That could be that users are able to log in, there's certain kind of checks that you have to do to make sure that their login, say their password is secure enough, and so on. Once you have that set of requirements, you then go and make a design. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, and we'll look at some of those in upcoming slides. Once you make the design, then you go on to development. You actually build the system or a prototype of the system, and then you test it. The point of iterative design, though, is that in all of these stages, we're going back and forth and cycling around. So once you define your requirements, it may be that you get to design and then realize that some of your requirements weren't well spelled out. So before you move on to the development phase, you may go back and refine your requirements and then go on to design again. Once you get to development, again, you may decide you need to change your design or your requirements. So you can go back to one of those earlier phases. Then once you move on to testing, you again may refine your requirements, but you also may go back and change any of the other steps in this process. 
So we're iterating around through a design, but we're doing it in a way that we allow ourselves to adjust any of the requirements, design, or implementation along the way. Let's talk about system-centered design. This is something that doesn't involve a lot of users or resources, but it's, one, it's a design methodology that happens a lot. Essentially, we ask questions like, what can be built easily on this platform? What can I create from the available tools? And what can I do as a programmer that I find interesting to work on? So some of these are important questions. For example, if you're building an authentication system for a mobile device, it could be a huge amount of additional work if you want to implement a totally novel authentication system when the platform already supports a few different ways of doing things. So it's important to ask that because it may not be worth dozens or even hundreds of hours of additional work to implement a totally new authentication system when you can rely on things that are supported already within the system. At the same time, some designers use this as an easy way out of coming up with anything new because they look at just what's available and aren't willing to do extra work on top of it. User-centered design is a very popular way of doing design within human-computer interaction and it focuses on the users and their importance to the system. These designs are based on users' abilities and their needs, the context in which they're working, the work that they're doing, and the tasks that they have to accomplish. The golden rule of interface design is really to know the user. So when we talked about that previous example of doctors trying to circumvent the security system on their portable machines by putting styrofoam cups over the proximity detectors, that's an example of where user-centered design wasn't followed that security system did not take into account the user's abilities and needs, the context, the work they were trying to do in the tasks, and as a result it was a poor system for them to work with. User-centered design tries to take all of these user needs into account and the design is based around that. Participatory design is really a type of user-centered design where users are actually brought into the design process. It addresses the problem that sometimes our intuitions as designers are wrong. If we do interviews or talk to people, they're not necessarily precise. And designers might not know the user well enough to answer all the issues that come up during the design. So even if I talk to users and come up with a list of tasks, they may tell me things that are useful, but when I actually get into doing the design, I may have more questions that I can't answer. The solution that participatory design offers is that there's actually a pool of end users that participate in the process of creating the design. And what I'd like us to do now is actually to hear Dr. Druin, Clegg, and Guha from our previous interview talking about participatory design since this is the core of their work. So, um, so participatory design slash co-design is when you involve um, the people, the target group that would be end users for your technology in the actual design of the technology. Um, there are various levels of engagement that you that, that those groups can take on. So there's some people who sort of um, who who might do like interviews and observations and think of that as participatory design. Um, we tend to think of participatory design. You're actually bringing in those end users to give you to generate design ideas that you're actually going to to take it and you know take with you. But um, so and you might also engage those. Um, you might engage those participants in doing some of that initial work and doing maybe some interviews and observations themselves of other people. Um, but but also you have we have techniques um, where we're 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 actually working with the end users to um, generate those those designs. Mm -hmm. in the and I think that also in our participatory design process and our co-design process, we work with. Um, our target user group is children, so we work with children as design partners throughout the design process. Um, and that means that for us, we view the children as, as integral to the design process as we are. And we're an interdisciplinary team on top of that. So, you know, um, my background is in education, Tammy's is in computer science, Allison's got design and education and computer science. So while we bring different disciplines to the table, the children bring the perspective of, I am an eight-year-old now in 2014. Um, and I, I don't have that. So my background in child development is as important as her, her perspective on being eight in 2014. Um, and really going on this journey of design together with everyone as an integral part is, is what I consider co-design the whole way through. 
I would say that the litmus test is, are you elaborating with mm -hmm. your users, mm -hmm. okay? Is, um, so Tammy's a teacher, mm -hmm. and I could ask questions of Tammy, okay, mm -hmm. like what she does as a teacher, mm -hmm. but Tammy needs to, I need to give an idea to Tammy, and Tammy needs to say, you know what, I like that idea, but what if you changed it, and you made sure that five kids were in the classroom at the, uh, doing that at the same time. And then I said, well, I don't know if that would work with five, but you know what, three could work, and then, and so on. So, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, in terms of security, it's, it's absolutely, you know, who, um, who needs to be secure, who owns the security, who, you know, and how can you have that elaborative conversation mm -hmm. so that you're not sure whose idea ultimately was. And that, that to me, is the litmus test of, of co-design. Right. And so it's not just about like kind of interviewing them about, so what do you do every day and what are your practices or that kind of thing, but it's more about interviewing them about like what should this thing that I'm designing look like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Getting them to elaborate on that. Yeah. yeah, and it's not just interviews because or, yeah. We, yeah, we do okay. use lots of different design techniques and we use a lot of artifact um, creation mm -hmm. to actually bridge that conversation because, you know, we can talk till the cows come home between yeah. the three of us, but, you know, a lot of times people feel a little bit uncomfortable, like sort of sharing ideas and going back and forth. And so then we have different techniques and, and many other people do uh, around the world in, in elaborating, um, in creating that elaboration process. Brainstorming is also a tool that's used in a number of design processes and can be a design process by itself. The graphic that we see here is part of the IDEO design process. You'll see a link in this week's material to a TED Talk that really gets into detail about the interesting brainstorming design process they have there. But again, we have an iterative process where we try to understand what people need, we observe them, we visualize and predict what's going to happen, we evaluate and refine our design, and we implement it, and then go back through that cycle again. So this is another iterative design process. We have users and people giving us feedback. We're testing and evaluating, but we're trying to come up with a lot of ideas in the brainstorming process. And so I'd like us now to look at a couple videos that give examples of good and bad brainstorming design uh, provided by Stanford. You can borrow your neighbor's wrappers. Like another paper towel. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I think a good idea would put it be to put the gum on the window, but. I don't know if people think that's a good one or... And when you want to save your gum, you just put it in, keeps it at the correct temperature, and then you take it out when you're ready to eat it again. I love that. That is awesome! That is amazing! I know a guy doesn't realize we should go do it right yeah. now! Yeah. yeah! Humidifiers. Every student has a little humidifier at their desk that they put their gum in and it preserves it. Like that? You know, keep the gum at the correct consistency for rechewing. Um, I think we're done with Oops. humidifiers. Yeah. Let's move on. Swim in the pool, move it, and what you would really do is you blow it up and it goes up into the sky. Wait, I loved your first idea. Who had the first idea? You did. Did you have the first idea? No, you did. Well, I thought, what you, was were, it? I thought I, you were supposed to have it. There was something about bracelets. I got an idea. So what if we had this container, but not just any container. It's small enough to fit in your pocket and... Yeah, we can partner up with a company like, I don't know, that, uh, that makes a solution and make it cheap for us, but, um... ...and they told me how to brainstorm effectively, okay? So, Jackie, would you mind writing? Okay. And be sure to capture all the ideas, right? Because all of them? Every idea is important, yeah, even the wild ones, because that's how you get to really innovative solutions. And one thing is defer all judgment on other people's ideas and your own, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is back. We're going to figure out and how can we preserve gum, okay? Let's get some really wild ones. Let's see how many we can get. Okay, gum. Ready, go. Okay, okay. okay you have a notebook with gum wrappers in it. Notebook nice with wrappers. gum wrappers. Yeah, awesome. awesome. Let's build off of that. Let's build off the idea. I love that. So the wrappers, they could add flavor to it. So every time you put your gum in it, yeah. it's a new type of flavor. With Ooh. like powder. And oh, yeah, and on top that. of that, they can be warm so they can preserve the consistency. Warm, nice. Oh, I love one. that. Flavor. I love how you drew that. That's really important to be visual because it helps you get other ideas. To build off with Jackie ideas, what if the notebook came with different flavor, powder flavor that you can choose and empty it into oh, the wrapper? Oh, yeah, I love that. Flavor your own gum. And you, 
You can like trade, yeah. Yeah, and, and you can download oh flavors from the internet. I love that. We can even have like a multiplayer game. Oh, wow. Multiplayer game with trading. Nicholas, an extra pound. So I almost interrupted you, but you don't ever want to, uh, you don't ever want to cut anybody off, right? We want to stay focused on, on the topic. That's a great one. I know, um, I have one. Okay. There can be a student, and this student, his whole, his or her whole responsibility is to hold a blow dryer on the gum, and then no well, matter who comes in. Yeah, headline. That's one of the things they said. Like, if you had an idea to spit out, just give me a headline for that, because it sounds like a really good idea. Oh, um, student holds blow dryer on gum. Blow dryer. Gotcha. Perfect. That's exactly what we want to do. Look how many ideas we have. Let's try to count. Let's try to count these. How many do you think we've got? Yeah, we've been running for like three minutes already. We've got 57 ideas. Awesome! Wow. Woo! All right. These school rocks. No team. No. And to conclude, we finally have designer-centered design. And Steve Jobs really embodied this when he says, it isn't the consumer's job to know what they want. And if we look at these phones, for example, this is a series of phones by Nokia, all the left phones, and then the iPhone on the right. The Nokia phones really show a progression of how mobile phones evolved, and you see them approaching something with bigger screens and smaller buttons. But the iPhone, when it came out, really was a totally transformative design in cell phones. And that's not something you necessarily could have come up with if you had a group of average cell phone users together. It was a transformative design that threw out all of the things we knew about and added something else. Designers are trained to be good at coming up with these kinds of ideas. And a lot of times if you talk to average users, they may get stuck in ideas of what they've seen before in either other contexts or the tools that they're used to working with and may not be able to come up with these radically new designs. Designers are better at this and so leaving some of the control in the designers hands so they can look at consumers and know what will help them do their job better even if the users don't know that themselves can lead to great innovation. So in conclusion, users can give a lot of valuable insight for design. They can tell us about tasks, the context that they're working in, and their needs. In addition, we want design methodology to support designers in coming up with new ideas. And in almost all of these design methodologies, we see that it's important to iterate to build better systems. Try some ideas, prototype them, design them, test them, and then go back and refine at every stage of the process in order to come up with something good. We're going to look at some case studies of examples of design and development of systems in cybersecurity to really see how this plays out. In this video, we're going to look at an example of usability for the average user. And in particular, we're going to focus on Firefox's untrusted connection error. This is an important security error that happens when Firefox tries to connect to a website that has an invalid security certificate. But the error is pretty technical and may not be accessible to the average person. So I've brought in a computer savvy user who's not a computer scientist and I'm going to have him go through the process of receiving that error and he's going to tell us what he thinks it means and what he should do. All right. So sitting at the desk here, we have our computer savvy, non-computer scientist who's going to go through a process of getting a common security error on the browser, and we're going to see what he has to say about it. So computer savvy, non-computer scientist, I want you to go to twitter.com, and it'll probably auto-complete, so just go in the bar at the top and do twitter.com okay. and hit enter. All right, so I want you to read what's on the screen and then tell me what you think it means. This connection is untrusted. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Uh, you read whatever you would read if you encountered this in your normal browsing life. Right. You've but asked Firefox to connect securely to Twitter.com, but we can't confirm that your connection is secure. What do you think that means? That means they don't know that they... Firefox doesn't know whether the connection to Twitter is secure. And then it says, normally sites will present trusted identification to prove that you're going to the right place. However, this site's identity can't be verified. So Firefox can't be ver can't verify that it's Twitter, actually Twitter. 
So what do you think the risks are if you see an error like this? Well, it could be a spoof site, or it could be taking me to somewhere that is not actually Twitter. So what would you do if you got this error? In real life, I would ignore it. And so what, like in real, so pretend we're in real life, what would you actually do here on this screen? I don't know. Try to click on whatever button they give me. And then try to type the whole thing into Google. Aha, uh -huh. so it says I understand the risks. If you're reading, read out loud for us. It says, if you understand what's going on, and I have a vague notion, I may be wrong. Wait, can... before you continue, what is your vague notion about what's actually going wrong? That there's a, a disconnect between Firefox and Twitter, and Firefox can't verify that it's going to Twitter, but it looked like the Twitter address to me, um, and it was, you know, I, I found it also through Google, so I, I, I think it's Twitter. And so then it says, if you understand what's going on, you can tell Firefox to start trusting this site's identification. But even if you trust the site, this error could mean that someone is tampering with your connection. Do you know what that means when it says someone's tampering with the connection? I have a vague concept that it means someone might be... have gained access to my computer or you know, is, I don't know, siphoning off information between what Firefox is doing and what Twitter is doing. Okay. But it's only Twitter. It's not my bank. Um, so I'm not sure there's that much harm in this case. But I don't understand it that well. Would you do this, I understand the risks thing, if it were your bank? Probably not. Or my credit card yeah. statement? Probably not. Okay. So I can add an exception, maybe. If you're reading, read it out says, loud. You are about to override how Firefox identifies this site. And it says legitimate banks, stores, and other public sites will not ask you to do this. And it says the certificate status is this site attempts to identify itself with invalid information. It's outdated information. The certificate is not currently valid. It is impossible to verify whether this identity was reported as stolen or lost. Are you worried about that or not? Yeah, I'm worried about it. And it seems like Firefox is going to some effort, I think it's Firefox, to yeah. not let me do this. So I'll just not do it. I'll cancel. Okay. Get me out of here. Okay. But I'm still not sure what happened. Thank you, computer savvy non computer scientist, for helping us process this error message. I'm happy to help. So, what are some lessons we can take away from watching this video? First, the user knows that something bad is happening, but he's not really sure what. He's able to read back some of the possible errors that the screen is telling him, but he doesn't really know what those mean or how they would work. The user also has good general strategies. For example, he said he'd worry more about sites with sensitive information like his bank or his credit card, but with Twitter he's not too worried. That's a great strategy, but if he were, for example, to be facing a man-in-the-middle attack where someone would hijack his password and potentially his email address that he uses to log in, if that password's repeated, he actually could make a lot of his accounts vulnerable. So his strategies are good, but because he doesn't understand what the possible security risks are, and they're not communicated to him by this error in a way he can understand, he may make himself vulnerable if he were to go around this error. And finally, the error message that Firefox shows relies on a lot of information that the average user doesn't understand. The example user we had here is actually quite computer savvy, but he didn't understand a lot of the technical terms and jargon. He doesn't understand what security certificates are, how they work, when they expire, what that means, and how they can be spoofed or inaccurate credentials can be sent to allow an attack. 
So the Firefox does a very good job of discouraging people from continuing on when they encounter this error message. They're not doing a very good job of explaining what could be happening. So a question for you to think about and to have in the discussion is, how could we improve this? If we wanted to have an error message that appears when there's an invalid security certificate, what could we do to make it so a really average user could sort of understand what's going on there and make good decisions? It's not a bad idea to really discourage them from taking a risky action, but it's even better if we can educate them on what's happening. So think about how we could improve that error message. So in the previous video, we just saw what happens when a computer savvy user who's not a security specialist encounters an SSL warning in their browser. Now we're going to focus more on that as an academic intellectual case study. And to do that, we're going to read this paper, Crying Wolf, an Empirical Study of SSL Warning Effectiveness. You'll find a link to the PDF of this paper in the materials for this week on Coursera. And you should read the paper before going through the lecture because then you'll have a better background for it. Now, just as a reminder, these SSL warnings are messages that come up in your browser when it encounters a problem with the security certificate for a secure website. So that could be that the certificate is expired, that it's signed by the wrong domain, or that the browser doesn't recognize the signing authority for the certificate. When a user encounters that, it's possible that there's just a meaningless error, like if the clock is set incorrectly on their computer, making security certificates look expired when they're not. But they also can be indicators of man-in-the-middle attacks or other security problems that will prevent a user from securely accessing a website. The browser's goal is to discourage users from going forward, especially to secure sites, when it can't validate the security certificate. This paper looked at how effective those warnings are and how we might design more effective warnings. After this lecture, the next one you'll see is an interview with Lori Craner, the last author listed on this paper, and she's going to talk a little more about the process they went through in designing the alternative SSL warnings that we're going to see discussed in this paper. So let's start by taking a look at the three SSL warnings that were studied in the paper. The first one is this, which is the security warning that comes up when an invalid certificate is shown in Firefox 2. Again, if you print out the PDF of the paper or download it, you can read these messages more in depth, and you should take a look at them before you go through this lecture. The second is very similar to the message that we saw in the previous video um, showing that a secure connection failed. This is the message from Firefox 3. And finally, they looked at this SSL warning that comes up in Internet Explorer. So these were the three major browsers in use at the time that the paper was written. And the authors started out just by trying to see how people thought about these errors and how they responded to them. Their survey provided some interesting results. First, they looked at three different types of errors that could cause an invalid security certificate. And if we look on the horizontal, the x-axis here, we can see that those are having an expired certificate, having an unknown certificate authority, or having a domain mismatch where the certificate is for a different domain than the site the user is trying to access. They showed these errors to people along with how they would appear in each of the three different browsers that we just saw. And they asked them whether or not they would continue on to the site they were accessing. This table shows the percentage of respondents who said they would continue, that they would not continue, or maybe they would. You can see for an expired certificate, uh, many more people said they would continue than in the other two cases. And you can see in all of these cases, the people seeing the Firefox 2 error proceeded more, though in the last case of having a domain mismatch, that's a really small percentage of people. Still, we see 30-40% of people say they would continue even when they see these SSL errors. Now, depending on the site they're going to, that might be okay. If you're going to a site where you're just browsing, there's no secure or interesting personal information there, it may not matter that you don't have a secure connection. That's something that's addressed later in this study, which we'll talk about. 
But another interesting result that came out of this survey were comments from people about why they would continue. That includes things like, I use a Mac so nothing bad would happen. This user trusts their system so they don't think they have anything to worry about with the SSL certificate expired. While it is the case that Macs have fewer viruses that they run into than a Windows machine does, viruses aren't really the risk with an invalid security certificate, so this person's confidence in their operating system actually doesn't help them in the case of the security error that they're running into. Another user said, since I use FreeBSD rather than Windows, there's not much risk. Again, this is a similar understanding of the general security risks that come with a certain operating system that don't actually apply to the security case in question. And finally, one user says, on my Linux box, nothing significantly bad would happen. So these users are all focused on their computers and the risks that their computers face, but they don't quite understand that they're actually facing a risk of transmitting personal information that could be intercepted and used in ways that they don't like. So the study, after doing that survey, wanted to see if there were possibly ways they could create a better SSL warning. So they started off with this experimental warning page. They say the secure connection failed, and then they ask people what type of website were you trying to reach? A bank or another financial institution, an online store or an e-commerce website, other and I don't know. Those first two are places where you might be transmitting sensitive information, like your banking information, login information, or things like credit card or other personal information if you're shopping. If you're not going to a site where you'd send some of that secure financial information, it may be the case that you don't actually need to worry about the certificate being expired. So they had a second page that came up. If users were not going to one of those sensitive websites, they would go ahead and pass them on to the website. So if I said I was going to another website and clicked continue, it would say OK and send me along to my destination. If I had indicated I was going to one of those first two more sensitive websites, then I would get this very scary warning that comes up all in red. This says there's a high risk of security compromise. It says that we're having our connection intercepted by another party or someone is impersonating the site that we're trying to go to, the attacker is trying to steal information, and we have this option to figure out do we just get out of there, do we have an option to see why the site was blocked. And down in the corner you see there's an option to ignore the warning which is small and so it's not something that someone's instinctively going to click on. They're more likely to look at the buttons. Users participated in an in-lab experiment where they were shown a series of different errors and asked whether or not they would continue on to the website they were trying to access. Those errors included the three that we saw for Firefox 2, 3, and for Internet Explorer, along with two experimental conditions. One of them is a multi-page system that first shows this error and then if the person's trying to access a website with sensitive information, it takes the user to this scary high warning page. And the second experimental condition only shows this high risk security page. So we have two experimental conditions and three existing SSL certificate warnings. And users were sent to either the Carnegie Mellon Library website or to a banking website. These are the results that the researchers found. On the horizontal x-axis we can see all five experimental conditions. The first three are the SSL certificate warnings from Firefox 2, Firefox 3, and Internet Explorer. Then we see the single page warning which is that red box that looks very scary. And finally the multi-page warning that first asks users which kind of site they're trying to go to and then if they're going to a more secure or sensitive website, takes them to the red warning page. On the vertical axis, we see the percentage of users who said they would ignore the warning and go on to the website. Finally, there's two bars shown for each of these different browser warnings. The blue one shows what percentage of users would go on to the website if they were accessing a banking website, and the green bar shows the percentage of users who would continue on to a library website, which is less sensitive. What we can see is that the single page warning, which is just that large red error box, 
had significantly fewer people in the banking website who said they would actually go on to the site. So that's good. You want people who are potentially going to transmit sensitive information to be less likely to do that when there's an SSL error. However, for the library website, the Firefox 3 error kept the most people off the site. The single page allowed the second largest number of people to go through. But you can see for the library website, overall, a lot of people were willing to ignore the SSL warning and go on to the website. It tended to be lower for banking, though looking at the Firefox 2 and Internet Explorer warnings, still 90% of people were willing to ignore that warning and go on to the banking website. The different SSL warning interfaces also had an impact on users who logged in based on whether or not they read or didn't read the error message and based on whether or not they understood it. Now, an important thing to note here is that we're looking at the percentage of users who logged in, and so none of these numbers you should expect to add up to 100%. So in the Firefox 2 condition, the first row, we can see that among people who read the error message, 20% of them logged in. Among people who didn't read the error message, 70% of them logged in. Moving on, when people read and understood the error message, 35% of them logged in. But when people read but did not understand the error message, 55% of them logged in. And we actually see that there's a big variation in all these numbers across the different interfaces. So for example, when we look at the single message, that was the experimental condition that just shows the red error box, 20% of people who read it logged in, 25% of people who didn't read it logged in, among people who understood it, 20% logged in, or 25% of people who didn't understand it logged in. The differences between these numbers are smaller than the differences between the numbers for Firefox 2, which suggests that it could be the interface that's warning people off, regardless of whether they read it, didn't read it, understand it, or don't understand it. Whereas in the Firefox 2 example, reading it makes a significant difference, as does understanding it. What this table is illustrating for us is that the interfaces can make a difference as to whether or not people log in, regardless of whether they read or don't read. And for some of the interfaces, it's very important that they read, where in other interfaces, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. The same goes for understanding. When people understand, they may log in much less than when they don't understand, but in some interfaces, that's not the case. Thus, the interface makes a big difference in users' behavior. So what lessons can we take from this study? Well, it's not necessarily that any one of these SSL warnings is superior to the others. Rather, this study gives us the insight that different interfaces can have major impacts on the security behavior of users. We saw in their results that, depending on which SSL warning they saw, some people were more or less likely to continue on to the site that they were trying to access. We also get some lessons that depending on what they're shown, users may be more or less likely to read the message in the first place, and depending on how it's presented, they may or may not understand it. We also saw very big differences in the rate of logging in among people who read and didn't read error messages and people who understood and did not understand them and that was related to the interface they saw. It also gives us some lessons about how to design these things. We want to think about what do we want users to do. In this particular case study, when there's an invalid security certificate, if a user is going to a site that requires sensitive information, like a banking site, we want them not to continue. That's the best security decision. So that's what we want users to do. And that leads us to the question, what do they, the users, need to understand in order to do that? So if we want the users to stop if they're going to a site that requests sensitive information when we can't validate the authenticity of that site, what do we need to tell users so they'll make that decision? These different interfaces don't necessarily convey information in a way that users will understand it. Again, we saw varying levels of understanding, and in our previous video where we saw our computer-savvy non-security person accessing one of these errors, we could tell that he wasn't exactly sure what was going on. 
that was echoed in this paper in the survey questions where a lot of users were giving answers related to their system rather than to the communication of their information which is actually what's at risk. So we need to think about how do we convey the risks and the situation to users because that will help them make the right security decision. And then finally we think about how can we make it more natural for users to do the right thing. We saw that in this study with the scary red page error. They had moved the option to ignore the warning and continue to the page to a less obvious place. So users wouldn't just click on a button to get past the error. They'd really have to read and find that link in order to proceed. These are lessons that guide a lot of design decisions and especially security decisions. We think about what the user should do, how do we make it clear and natural for them to make the right decision. In the next video, we're going to talk to Lori Craner, who is one of the authors of this paper, and get her take on some of the lessons and implications of this work.